for reporters, the France 24 investigative news magazine. Welcome back. You're watching uh, the France 24 debate, a special edition uh, on the eve of the second anniversary of the uprising in Syria. I want to w welcome back our guests, uh, Sophia Amara, who you saw in that report. She joins us uh, from Beirut, a France 24 reporter who had uh, 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 filed for us, most notably going with the rebels last August, all, all the way to Damascus and back, uh, um, and also here in the studio uh, with us. Um, we have uh, William Jordan, former political officer at the U.S. Embassy in Damascus, Aysa Amidani of the Union for Syrian Patriots. At the outset, I introduced your group as pro-Assad. You said that's not the case? Yeah, I'm pro-Syria, not pro-Pro-Syria, pro not pro-Assad. Okay. <laughs> Just to save Syria. Okay. <laughs> and Syrian opposition activist Ismail Hashem. Uh, I'm also pro-Syria, but no pro-Assad. <laughs> okay. Uh, when when we're, we, we, we saw in that report, um, Sofia Amara, I, I don't want to spend the whole time here eulogizing what has happened over the past two years. But there was this sense two years ago of, a, of an inevitability that the, this would all spiral. Uh, did you at any point hold out hope that there could be some kind of solution? Well, what happened today with France and UK deciding finally after two years of a tragedy, the, tr the Syrian tragedy, to arm the, the rebels could be a start. At the same time, it's a solution and it's a problem because it comes very late. And after Bashar al-Assad leaves the country or leaves power, if ever it happens, uh, we will find a society that is overarmed, and uh, as the report just said it, some arms could uh, finish into the wrong ar the wrong hands, and this is that that will be the problem then. But for now, arming the the the, the uh, arming the um, the rebels is definitely uh, the solution, or could be a, a start of a solution, even if it comes very 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 late, and this tragedy could have been avoided if it has been, if it had been done before. All right, we're going to hear from the, what the French president had to say uh, uh, on Syria this Thursday in, in just a moment. But first, I, I want to get back, William Jordan, to uh, a statement we heard from uh, one of the people interviewed in that report, Basma Kodmani. Uh, she said, even if the opposition uh, was united, Assad would still not fall. And she pointed the finger at the international community. Is that true? I agree with the first part of her premise uh, that uh, the Syrian opposition is one of the reasons why uh, Syrian opposition disunity is one of the reasons why uh, the regime has not been successfully challenged. I think that that's a, a, a fundamental weakness uh, going forward to bringing down the Assad regime, but I don't think that it's the fault of the international community. I think that it's, it's in many ways a fault of Syrian history is one of the reasons why, in my opinion, the, the long-term outlook for Syria is bleak, not just because of what the Ba'ath Party has done over the past 50 years to Syria, but because of what even preceded the Ba'ath Party. I mean, Syria as a political entity has always been in, unstable and uh, beset by um, internal and external forces that play against it. Um, Arguably, the only force for stability has been uh, the Assad regime, uh, and I'm not here to defend it by any stretch, like, uh, like has already been said. Um, you know, I, 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 I'm here defending Syria, uh, not uh, the regime and its people. Uh, but, uh, but that's the historical reality against which a lot of this is playing out and will continue to play out once the regime is, 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 is down. And there's this feeling, again, of um, helplessness. Uh, to it all. Is there no way to, uh, to sort of break this deadlock? No, no, sorry. Is there no way to break the deadlock so that we'd stop this spiral? I think uh, the deadlock has been created in, uh, well, I, I don't agree it's a deadlock, in fact. First of all, uh, well, the regime, uh, uh, the country, Syria, has been progressing on the economical side and in the uh, political side, and uh, in 2010, everything was going very smooth and very correct. And in 2011, uh, when what, what you call this revolutionary uprising, there were a little uprising and a lot of demonstration of people asking for uh, human rights and democratic opening, 
and this was accepted immediately and even uh, the president it was recognized accepted immediately. It. yes it was accepted on the on the 4th of of april uh, the uh, emergency state has been lifted and uh, also uh, they recognized the power recognized the uh, demonstration the right to demonstrate pacifically and immediately there were a lot of violences uh, sofia well, Ma- sofia Mara, is, is that is that how you remember it <laughs> Uh, no, actually, and I, I, actually, I wanted to get back w- w- to what was said about the fact that the international community couldn't be held responsible for um, the time it took uh, for them to decide to arm the rebels. I, I, I do not agree because when I first met the Free Army, there were like three or four hundred men. Uh, they were not even called the Free Syrian Army. They were at that time in uh, August 2011 uh, called the Free Officers. And at that time, they didn't even want weapons. All what they wanted was a, a no-fly zone for a, a massive defection or massive uh, uh, units to leave the, the regular Syrian army and escape and put their families in security. And they didn't even want, they didn't even want weapons at that time. And I think hear that something went wrong. I know that we all know that the the Syrian opposition uh, was not united, but still the the ones who were fighting inside all wanted the same thing and they didn't get it. Well, I think that, uh, well, it is a big uh, problem also to talk about Syrian opposition, but there were opponents at that time, not opposition, because they were not organized first. And afterwards, when there were uh, an opposition, there is uh, uh, only an outside opposition which has been organized and held by uh, France, uh, the United States, and... uh, and, uh, and, uh, Turkey, and always uh, uh, paid by Saudi Arabians and by uh, Qatari, and uh, well, in the on the other side, there is big opposition inside the country, which started to work, and uh, and uh, they are actually there is big. Actually, there is a very big evolution in the democracy in the in Syria. I can say there is a new law on communication. There have been a new constitution that nobody <laughs> mentioned. A new uh, thirteen new parties, which yeah, has been I allow myself, my neighbor a new here law probably on communication. Didn't, uh, Sorry, let me continue. Yeah, the mission is uh, three, going to change. A, a new a new law on communication, and actually. Uh, all okay, the so opposition goes into uh, the means of communication, the official means of communication. The okay, TV but there, and there, the there radio. seems to be a disconnect between what you're so, describing and, and what we saw. Ismail Hashem. Well, probably my, my neighbor here, here never lived in Syria. Uh, I don't understand how we can say that things were smooth in Syria, economic situation were good, and no democracy, no freedom, no liberty, no nothing. Torture, terror, this is, that was Syria that you don't know probably. Um, well, probably things are as smooth as the skulls are, are falling on my people, your, your people heads. Is that is that smooth? Well, actually, that was not your question, Francois. Your question was how we can put uh, an end on this. Um, okay, this regime and this this fact, uh, anyone who knows Syria a little bit knows that very very uh, very clearly. This regime will never stop killing his people. This regime will never stop committing this murder and this genocide. You said 70,000 uh, killed, well, that, this is the official statistic, okay? You have m- much more, much more casualties, much more displaced, uh, UN injured. statistics. Of course, yeah. okay, so this regime will never stop killing and that's why, that's why people of Syria don't understand why the international community didn't interfere yet. Why the, not even giving weapons right, to the, when, to the when, rebels. When the violence started to escalate, everyone thought there would be a tipping point after which the West or Turkey would step in. We saw in the report uh, one of the people there mentioning, why can't it be like in Kosovo or in or in Bosnia? Um, when you look now, um, at the number of sheer number of refugees in surrounding countries, uh, one million. The number of displaced, two and a half million. Um, what? Where? When is that tipping point? Where is it? 
a good question. I, I, I don't know when it's going to come in, in the sense of Western intervention. I mean, uh, and I don't even think from the point of view of the United States you're going to see any um, rapid movement, even if France and the UK uh, rush to start arming the Syrian rebels. I don't think you're going to see the United States rushing to do that. Again, I, I've said in different contexts on this platform, uh, you know, the administration is still in a certain amount of transition following uh, the re-election of President Obama. John Kerry is putting together his team at the State Department. Um, I think there will be a very deliberate and very careful uh, thinking about what to do next in Syria. Given really, even though he's been billed as being more hawkish than his predecessor, Hillary Clinton? Because there's a lot of institutional resistance to uh, rushing in. People have long memories about uh, what Syria represented. And indeed, um, you know, the, the history of, of the oppression of uh, and the, uh, the violent attacks on the Syrian people who've risen up in the past uh, under this regime. That is very much burned in the memory of American policymakers. So nobody wants to act precipitously. And on top of uh, a very traumatic war in Iraq for the United States, as well as uh, the, uh, the, the continuing engagement in Afghanistan, uh, I can tell you just from my own informal discussions with relatives and other friends back in the United States, there is zero desire to see the United States be part of or lead an international intervention into Syria all right, which, which brings us to the point that Sophia Amara made, the statement made by the French president entering that EU summit this Thursday. Uh, François Hollande uh, echoing a call made earlier in the week by the UK prime minister, uh, 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 echoing what had been a hint by David Cameron that we may go towards arming uh, the rebels. Uh, François Hollande, much clearer, it seems. France considers today that weapons are being delivered to Bashar al-Assad's regime by the Russians. We want the Europeans to lift the embargo on weapons, not to move towards all-out war. We think that the political transition has to be the solution for Syria. But we have to apply pressure on the regime and show that we support the opposition. So we should go this far. Hollande speaking after a one-on-one um, -on -one meeting with David Cameron this Thursday. His foreign minister earlier in the day going so far as to say the French and British would go it alone if the EU didn't lift its embargo. However, uh, the UK foreign secretary uh, more cautious when he spoke to reporters earlier in the day. We have no plans at the moment to do anything different from what I've announced in Parliament last week. Uh, that was to give that additional non-lethal support, as well as uh, training, advice and assistance. Uh, so we'll wait and hear what uh, uh, David Cameron says, whether it's uh, actually in sync or not with what François Hollande says. Either way, is it already too late? Uh, that's uh, uh, what Sophia Marat was alluding to earlier. And that's what the Financial Times thinks in its lead editorial this Thursday. It says that uh, half-hearted intervention may only prolong or worse deepen divisions in the opposition that sow the seeds of civil war after Assad's demise. Even decisive action will not succeed if the only goal is to reinforce moderates. That editorial, by the way, concluding that uh, you have to have some kind of political blueprint for what happens after Assad goes, something that's not really talked about much. Yes, indeed. But right now we're talking about saving lives. We're talking about hundreds of people suffering from this regime. Uh, right now we, we, we're talking to uh, international community, um, went to Libya, to Kuwait, to Iraq, to, to Bosnia, to Mali, to Somalia. I mean, Syrian people are wondering why, why our lives are, uh, we have no, no value. Uh, so they, this is a great uh, event this, this morning with what President Francois Hollande said. This is very good news for Syrian people. Well, we hope that this will go further and will be confirmed. Well, okay, but so how do you do it? How do you arm the rebels? Do you, who do you say, okay, you're a respectable uh, Guys, you have uh, intelligence. Like you, you have you, intelligence here in France, yeah. in Britain, in America. You know who to deal with. Come on, you, I mean, this, you're not going to give weapons to people. Uh, you're, you know, there is a free Syrian army. There, there were officers. I mean, th this is something not, not really uh, difficult to be done. I mean, I mean, it, that's that's really something we don't understand. That okay, we don't know really w w with who with whom to deal. That's why we're not helping out. 
I mean, this is something, uh, how, you, how you've done this in Libya in just uh, two days, uh, President Sarkozy and President Cameron, they've, they've done it and they saved life in Libya. W William Jordan, is it mission impossible to say, okay, we're going to give you weapons, but don't use them for a civil war once Assad falls? Well, again, uh, Libya is an example of why, uh, why this approach, why, why, why handing out arms without being careful um, doesn't make sense. Can I mean, you be careful? I, I don't think we can. I think it's very difficult to do that. If I had faith personally, and I you know, worked closely with the CIA in the course of my career on various things, if I had faith that they could actually vet everybody and be sure that they were only handing out the weapons to the right people, I would say go ahead with this. But we have a history in Afghanistan of having done exactly the same thing then, and in a way, what's, you know, we're fighting a war in Afghanistan now under completely different circumstances that partly re as a result of that. So, Sofia Maha, that brings us back to the, uh, the comment that you made in the report, which was that uh, the fact that there haven't been weapons handed out by the West has simply uh, bolstered the uh, hardliners and the jihadists. Yeah, some members of the CNS actually uh, 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 really admitted to me that some weapons were financed uh, to to by Qatar for the rebels. This is first of all. Second, I, I think uh, there is no chance whatsoever that the providers of the weapon that will be or might be sent by the Europeans or France or and UK to Syria inside Syria to help the rebels. There is no way whatsoever to control where. And how do uh, how will this uh, weapons will be uh, 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 given to these people? Because some units of the Free Syrian Army are mixed. I mean, uh, they they can have inside the same unit people who just left the, the uh, or military people who just left the the, the, the regular Syrian Army, but also people from uh, Jabhat al Nusra, which is an extremist uh, 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 jihadist militia uh, organization. Yes, de definitely. So there is no way to control it. I I mean, first of all, and second, I think that the, the, the international community now and, and, and France and UK, the, the decision is very courageous if, if ever it happens. But now it's a gambling attitude that they'll have. It is a painful necessity to, to arm these rebels, I guess. But at the same time, uh, 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 they have to do it to stop extremi extremism to, to grow up and to stop the blood inside Syria, this tragedy. At the same time, it's a risk they're taking because they waited so long that at the end of the day, uh, seeds of a civil war, even after uh, Bashar al-Assad leaves, uh, are there and we cannot deny it. So it's seeds like a kitu double, a poker, a poker game. Uh, it's sad to say so, double, but this double is the way nothing. I see it. Mm -hmm. all, all, all or nothing. I, I say something? I mean, I want to remind that from the beginning, everybody was uh, arming the rebels and even the uh, intelligence, and in, uh, especially the, in, uh, the uh, uh, German intelligence said also that there is only 5% of uh, the ASL who are Syrian and all the others are uh, foreign jihadists who came. And also, in several uh, opportunities, uh, some declarations about sending jihadists to Syria. About 160,000 jihadists came to Syria to uh, just to fight. And uh, so, and I want to tell I also think they had poor that information the exactions, they are, these informations are also very important. This yeah. means it's not from now that everybody is starting uh, to, to arm the uh, the uh, rebels and uh, it's uh, it's very and besides it's not only the rebels the Syrian rebels but also people coming from so anybody thirty different Assad countries is, is jihadist, from thirty opinion? different countries they come to uh, to uh, make uh, jihad in Syria and uh, all all I want to say today and uh, from the beginning uh, the the uh, uh, the regime in Syria was calling for uh, discussions from July, July 2011. Uh, there were uh, a call for a big uh, conference and to discuss for dialogue. It has been always rejected by, uh, by the opponents uh -huh. and uh, by the opposition, cool. sorry. And now I think the only issue today as everybody stresses on, that is the dialogue and reconciliation. We, we heard and dialogue and reconciliation, and certainly, but the, but the fighting has to stop uh, and the weapons have to stop. We heard the French president say Russia and Iran are supplying weapons. Iran, 
isn't the U.S. supposed to be speaking with Iran about uh, its nuclear program? Are they going to also be speaking about Syria? And shouldn't they just openly invite Iran to sit down and at the negotiating table? Uh, sure. I mean, I, but uh, the, I don't think the Iranians are going to agree to do that. I mean, that's that's always been they the problem. They haven't been invited uh, in, in in previous. We times. have we have opened. Uh, we have told the Iranians many on many occasions um, that we are ready to talk about a whole range of issues. The thing is, we do not want any preconditions as far as the content of the discussions. We want to be able to discuss everything on the table. The Iranians, however, have not been able to come back and accept that proposal. Can there be um, some kind of so solution where the Russians and the Iranians may budge? Uh, as far as they uh, still uh, keep saying that they will um, uh, keep uh, Bashar al-Assad on the on the head of the regime, there is no solution, of course. Uh, Which the Russians have wavered at on that on that point. Yes and no. Uh, w w actually, you have just to understand one thing. Um, the moment when this regime will sit around the table and start speaking about what, I don't know what, uh, he will cut the branch on, on which he's sitting on. So this regime will never stop killing his people. The only language this regime can understand is a strongest force that obliges him to, to stop this, uh, this massacre. All right, so there's a spiral where, where it only goes forward. Unfortunately, we're going we're gonna to have to leave it there because we're out of time. We're going to, of course, keep, keep watching this story. I, I want to thank Aysar Midani for being with us, Ismail Hashem, William Jordan, and Sofia Amara for being with us from Beirut. Thank you for joining us here for the special extended edition of the France 24 debate.